so uh, good morning everyone uh, so today uh, in our series of saturday atec uh, had next series uh, vaishnavi uh, nimbalkar who is our senior fellow uh, and phd at uh, dr mahankar's lab uh, in atec uh, would be taking the class on basics of molecular techniques uh, what a clinician should know so uh, i would request uh, vaishnavi please uh, start the class okay thank you ma'am thank you for the introduction i'll start with my presentation uh am i visible to everyone and audible yes ashwini okay so good morning everyone so uh, topic of today's presentation is basics of molecular techniques what a clinician should know i am vaishnavi nimbaika from mahivdar lab actually so what are the common molecular techniques which are used in clinical research are and what my uh, i have personally used are immunohistochemistry tissue homogenization tissue homogenization and protein quantification western blotting dna rna extraction and quantification polymerase chain reaction fluorescent in situ hybridization so uh, in today's presentation we will be covering mainly immunohistochemistry tissue homogenization and protein quantification western blotting dna rna extraction and quantification and chain reaction okay so these techniques we will be covering we will be covering mainly three techniques because the time constraint of the presentation and the uh, sample for this techniques are mainly of three types one is in vitro or cell culture based sample second is your um, animal model tissue sample and third is a uh, patient based that is clinical trial tissue sample okay so obviously the weightage uh, for the uh, animal tissue sample and more to the uh, human patient sample in this case uh, very less weight it is given to a cell culture or in vitro based uh, sample and its procedure okay so as most of us are working on head and neck cancer i would like to highlight here the and oral ca cavity is the major site of uh, head and neck there are two main animal models of oral cancer which are hamster model of buccal pouch carcinogenesis and mice model of trunk carcinogenesis which are in very in various ways similar to human disease progression okay and i have been working on both of this model so let's start with the first technique that is immunohistochemistry okay for immunohistochemistry the sample is a tissue sample or as i said a cell pellet or a patient uh, sample a tissue sample okay so the sample once you get as you can see in the picture it is fixed in a 10% buffered formalin okay so this buffered formalin what it does it fixes the sample and it uh, maintains the tissue integrity then the sample is serially dehydrated in series of alcohol and it is fixed in a paraffin block okay so as you can see in the bottom picture there is a person holding a cassette in which paraffin is pouring and the tissue is placed in that paraffin and a block after solidification of the paraffin uh, a block of tissue is made okay then this block is held in a machine called microtome okay and the sections of this blocks are made okay because of the paraffin the tissue is held in a proper position and we can see the different uh, internal parts of the tissue so once this sections are made these are taken on a polyelysin coated slides and these slides are then used for further ixt uh if you have any question in between you are, if you are not following you can ask me also okay so so, so vaishnavi sorry uh, uh, yeah. i think can you please repeat it once again that the part from the first is photograph yeah sure uh the sample from sample preparation yes. hello yes. yeah yes okay so see you get a tissue sample it can be any tissue sample it can be a tissue from animal or patient okay it can be lung 
a small part of tissue okay which can be fixed in a small block so this tissue is first, first fixed in 10% buffered formalin and this formalin is helping hello go ahead go ahead sometimes the mics are on so it get causes uh, confusion okay 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 so this buffered formalin helps to maintain the tissue integrity okay so uh, nuclear cytoplasm everything is intact inside the cell and uh, then this tissue is re dehydrated in alcohol this is just a protocol important thing is it is first embedded in a parafilm block okay uh, we all of know what is parafilm is in a uh, histology department uh, of actric and tmh this procedure takes place where the tissue is fixed in a parafilm block okay uh, how it is fixed that it the, uh, the this is the steel cassette in which the parafilm is poured then you place tissue of your interest in that parafilm and after solidification you get this kind of a block it is properly named okay and then on this machine which is called microtome you get thin slices of this block okay so eventually what you get are the thin slices of the tissue and this thin slices as you can see series of these slices these slices are taken on a uh, uh, polyelicin coated slide okay and these slides are then further used for immunohistochemistry okay so this uh, IHC can be done on two types of tissue. It can be done on a uh, paraffin embedded tissue, and it can be done on also frozen tissue. Okay, so in the case of paraffin embedded tissue, the machine which is used is microtome, and in case of frozen tissue, it is cryostat. As it as the name suggests, it is basically a uh, it is cutting the tissue at a lower temperature. Okay, so in case of paraffin tissue, it preserves the tissue morphology. and in case of frozen tissue it preserves the enzyme function and antigenicity most of the our enzymes in tissues and cells are working at lower temperature so if you heat basically in all this procedure procedure heating is also there so enzyme get inactivated in most of the cases which is not the case in case of frozen tissue but it has its own disadvantages also um like formation of ice crystal can negatively affect and here the paraffin embedded tissue if this formalin fixation is for longer time then it will uh, ruin your protein of interest and you may not be able to see it uh, in ihc okay so we take this slides carry forward and i'll explain you the protocol of ihc ihc or immunohistochemistry is a two day technique okay first day what we do is Heat heat the slides at sixty degrees Celsius for hour. So why this heating is done is to melt the paraffin. We are not interested in the paraffin. We are interested in the tissue. So once this paraffin is melt melted, it is deep. Uh, it is dipped in xylene so that all the melted paraffin will get dissolved in xylene, and then uh, the tissue is passed through series of xylene plus alcohol, then pure alcohol, then seventy percent alcohol, and finally in a buffer. buffer as we all know it is a solution mainly water based which is able to resist the change in ph okay so why we want to take the tissue from xylene to buffer because xylene is non polar and buffer is polar and all a further procedure of ihc is polar okay so we are using water based uh, reagents then the main important part of ihc is antigen retrieval which takes place it can be done by three buffers stress edta sodium citrate and edta so what mainly this three buffer do is they expose your protein of interest uh, to the primary antibody okay so uh, by heating the tissue or the slides uh, in this buffers will help to uh, prevent uh, like uh, to break the cross linkages by formaldehyde but the fixative which we used in initial procedure and so that the protein of your interest is exposed and then endogenous peroxidase blocking is done so i'll explain you what is endogenous peroxidase uh, with the help of a picture okay next uh, in the next slide then serum blocking is used so in ihc you are interested to see the protein of your interest where it is located in that particular cell whether it is in cytoplasm it is whether it is in nucleus or it is in cell membrane 
correct and in how much quantity it is expressed so however in your tissue there are so many other proteins present so you have to block them block their antigens exposed by non specific proteins so serum as uh, you already know that it is a bulk mixture of uh, lots of uh, proteins so we use a horse serum in case of laboratory to block uh, this uh, tissue and then primary antibody is uh, added to this slide and it is incubated overnight so that the primary antibody what it does it goes and it binds to the antigen okay if you for example if you are interested to see where egfr is present in the cell then antibody against egfr is used it goes in the tissue it finds where egfr is present it binds there okay so and what next day it is done it uh, washing with the pbst is done it is a buffer pbst is a buffer and uh, in that twin 20 is a detergent it is a mild detergent which is used to wash the slides okay so excessive uh, primary antibody if uh, tissue is uh, having then it is washed out by this uh, washing step then secondary antibody is added now what secondary antibody does it binds to the your primary antibody okay and then again washing with pbst buffer is done so that excessive secondary is removed then ab complex incubation is done what is ab complex what is primary secondary in detail i'll give you pictorially i'll explain you in next slide then wash with PBST so to remove excess AB. Then DAP staining is done. Now DAP uh, is a compound which gives colored product. Okay. And then counter staining with hematoxylene is done. Now hematoxylene is a stain which stains the nucleus. Okay. So we can see the cells which are stained or, or, or unstained inside the uh, like under the microscope with the help of this counter stain. DPX, uh, the slides are then mounted with DPX and then they are visualized under the microscope. So this is a pictorial representation of the protocol uh, I was uh, narrating you. So if in case, if, if you consider that this is a tissue antigen, this orange color, this primary antibody, which is specific for this tissue antigen will go and bind to it. So this antibody has two region, FC region and FAB region. So this secondary antibody is against this primary antibody. And it will go and bind this primary antibody. Now, the secondary antibody is labeled with an enzyme, uh, is labeled with biotin. Okay. And AB a complex, which I said earlier, is a complex of avidin and biotin. Now, as you can see in the picture, avidin has four sites for biotin. So, once you add AB complex, one of the uh, avidin binds to the biotin on the secondary antibody. Okay, and this avidin biotin complex has uh, one more enzyme which is called horseradish peroxidase. So, for which the substrate is DAP. So, once you add DAP on this uh, slide, this so on uh, till, till day two, you have this entire structure form the antigen, primary, secondary, AB complex, and to the AB complex, enzyme is there. So, once you the moment you add DAP, this horseradish peroxidase enzyme gets its substrate, which is converted to a product because it is an enzyme. It, the nature of the enzymes are to convert substrate to product and this product is a colored product, brown stain. So wherever in your tissue, this antigen, which is of your interest is present, it will get stained as brown. Okay. So, and uh, why I said, uh, endogenous peroxidase blocking because in your tissue also inherently some traces of this enzymes are present okay so that are blocked in this state so that you get a very per per perfect and uh, precise staining where only your tissue antigen is present that position only gets stained as brown okay so these are some of the representative images, how exactly an IHC looks like. So this is a nuclear staining where you can see this is a, a tumor tissue sample. All of these are tumor tissue samples from my study, uh, oral tissue, tumor tissue samples from hamster buckle pouch. And as you can see, uh, this is the staining for PCNA. Now PCNA is a proliferating cell nuclear antigen, which is present in the nucleus. Okay, and, okay. Uh, so all the nuclei, wherever PCNA is present, they are stained brown. 
while if can you see the blue nuclei is also in those cells the pcna was not present so those cells get stained by hematocytin and they are representing as blue similarly in case of egfr in case of oral cancer egfr is over expressed okay so uh, egfr is present in membrane so when whenever you add antibody against uh, specific against egfr and you do ilc you see this kind of a membrane staining where you can see each cell has one nucleus and has a clear cytoplasm and has a membrane which is which get stained by uh, ilc okay so wherever this kind of a brown staining is present all of these cells are expressing egfr second uh, sorry this is uh, a little uh, mistake from my side this is a cytoplasmic staining of cox2 okay cox2 is an inflammation molecule which is present in cytoplasm so as you can see because this is a tumor tissue it is highly inflamed in all of the cells this cox2 is present you can see the blue nuclei in all uh, cells and the periphery of this blue nuclei is stained by uh, is stained as brown that means cox2 is present in all of this are you getting everyone i uh, what i'm saying or should i simplify more no yes definitely i think this is fine go ahead okay so uh, finally how the data of ihc is represented in a paper or in a conference or uh, in any presentation uh, where so whatever your treatment groups are there those those are compared all at once okay so this these are my controls this is my carcinogen treated tissue that means it is a tumor tissue and these are treated tissue this is a chemo preventive agent pbps is a chemo preventive agent which i have used in my study which is known to decrease the number of tumors okay so we want to see how it is decreasing the number of tumors so whether it is decreasing expression of pcna or whether it is decreasing expression of egfr or what molecule okay so we have done ihc for these markers on the tissue samples so as you can see in controls where there is no tumor uh, there is very less expression of uh, pcna and egfr in case of carcinogen tumor tissue samples it is very highly expressed because these are highly uh, proliferating and uh, tumors so and once the, these tissues are treated with pbps okay which is a test compound Uh, even in tumor tissue samples the expression the number of cells expressing this molecule is are getting decreased also the intensity of the staining is decreased so in case of ihc there are two things which are important number of cells expressing the antigen and the intensity of the staining okay so uh, in uh, in the, the, like in this uh, groups i couldn't find uh, like the number of tumors were very less so it was as good as control and as you can see the expression is decreasing okay uh, hi vishnuvi yes i would like to ask you here one thing uh, what difference you find in between pcn and egfr here uh what difference uh, means in what sense uh in 1.5 pbs control and carcinogen okay. Okay. So, book more about that? Sure, sure. So, yeah. So, how we now this is the representative images of these IHC. How to do analysis of this IHC images? Correct. So, because you so to quantitate the uh, this is what your question is, right? I was coming to this yes, graph yes, yes. Uh, down. So, how to quantitate this? Uh, like how in how much quantity the expression is decreased? That we have to know. Correct. So this is done by a software which is called Imagery. What that software does? Basically, it is operated by us only. So we have to feed that software each and every image of the animal. Okay, uh, the animal means the tissue section from the animal, and then we have to count the number of cells which are positive. Okay, and then the statistical analysis test is done. And hundred, uh, like a percentage positive uh, cells are counted, and they are compared uh, between the groups. So what I have done in the below graphs is you can see these are different controls. These are percentage positive cells or proliferation index. Okay, in carcinogen you can see the percentage positive cells are very high. In uh, treated groups they are coming down, but they are not reaching as good as uh, controls, but they are coming down. So 
and a statistical test is applied where which tells you whether this decrease is statistically significant or not okay and uh, similarly in case of egfr the number of positive cells are counted uh, and uh, how many number of cells uh, are counted is that if you take a tissue say a, a, a one slide from a, say one tissue sample then we have to capture 10 images of those slides at 40x magnification and then finally we have to count around 1000 cells now this out of this 1000 cells nine, 900 can be positive 100 can be negative anything can happen okay so total count should be 1000 then from those 1000 cells we have to calculate percentage positive cells this percentage positive cells are then compared between the groups and we see whether the expression of this marker is decreasing or not with the help of a suitable statistical test. Okay. I hope I have answered your question. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, this is a recent publication Vestami, from our. Yeah. Uh, Vestami, uh, Dr. Poonam, uh, sorry to interrupt you. So, one thing I would ask you is from a clinician point of view uh, to sure. make it. Uh, so, can I ask you in a very simple terms? Yeah. Can you tell us that, uh, like, they cut off, uh, like you said, there are two parameters. One is huh. the number of positive cells and huh. other is going to be intensity. Right? Right. So, right. so how do you decide for intensity? I think number of cells you explained to us right now. Right. How do you explain and what is the this cutoff? This cutoff is going to be different for different type of, I think, histologies, right? Uh, the different right. types of tissues. Correct. So right now I have shown you only the percentage positive cells data. There is one more data of intensity where uh, you have to like the similar images as i told you for the counting the number of cells we have captured 10 images from one slides okay so this same images you have to expose to the software the software automatically detects the intensity and it gives you in a form of excel sheet uh, how much is the intensity in each and every uh, image and we have to uh, again then compile the data and give it to a statistical uh, and run a statistical test and see whether the intensity which is decreasing uh, is significant or not. So in that case, we don't have to do the manual counting of the cell. The, you just have to expose the image to the software. The software automatically detects the intensity and it gives you uh, the data. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is with respect to animals. Now, in case of humans, you mostly uh, this kind of software-based analysis is not done. Okay, so this is a, a paper from our lab, which is recently published in British Journal of Cancer, where uh, prognostic and predictive significance of nuclear HIP-1 alpha expression in locally advanced HNSC patients treated with chemoradiation or with or without a nematozumab is treated. So what is the crux? I Because we are discussing only techniques here, I'll just go to the method that here, uh, tissue samples from 404 patients are taken and uh, they were analyzed uh, to evaluate expression of HIP1 alpha, EGFR and phospho EGFR. Now in this case, HIP1 alpha is a, a hypoxia marker, EGFR uh, and phospho EGFR, as you all know, it is uh, a membrane, membrane marker. Okay, so, uh, sorry, maybe this is not visible to you because of the upper panel. So IHC uh, is done on all of these uh, tissue samples and uh, IHC staining is evaluated by semi-quantitatively by pathologist. Now here in case of analyzing patient, uh, uh, patient tissue IHC slides, pathologists come in a picture where they uh, give us the intensity of the staining and also percentage positive cells uh, uh, in uh, uh, they give us the percentage positive cells and the intensity from that h score is calculated okay so in this in this study two independent pathologists were uh, uh, were uh, helping us to do the analysis what they did is they uh, saw uh, whatever 404 slides for each of the marker and they gave us the intensity and the percentage positive cells and then its score is calculated by formula, this sigma PI, I is equal to one, where uh, PI is the percentage of stain tumor cells and I is the intensity. Now this intensity they give in terms of weak, moderate and strong. 
Now we have to assign number to them. Weak is one, two is moderate, and three is strong. And then you get X score in the range of one to three hundred. And this X score is then compared between the groups. Okay. Uh, Vaishnavi, how yeah. much is the subjectivity to this? Uh, uh, exactly regarding the intensity uh, precisely the question is so uh, sometimes this happens that one slide is graded as weak by one pathologist and sometimes the same slide is graded as moderate by the another pathologist okay so we have to take a consensus call by both of the pathologists so such slides this is uh, a work by my senior usha patel so such slides she uh, like where the discrepancies were there so she took all the slides together uh called both of the pathologists together showed them at one go and they consistently decided that yes so this is a weak or moderate and how much is the percent so that is there and uh, i am not a correct person to tell you but uh, she has run a statistical test also to uh, check uh, how much is the discrepancy and how much discrepancy is statistically allowed in this kind of data all right Uh, yes, oh, yes. Have, right, uh, Rashmi. Correct. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, in her case, so as I was discussing the technique, I will let you know the details of the technique. So, Hifon Alpha. So, there are different companies which sell these primary antibodies. Hifon Alpha, EGFR, and Phospho EGFR were taken from Novus and Cell Signaling. Or uh, the host species was Rapid, uh, the in which the primary antibody was raised. The secondary antibody which we use then it is anti rapid. Okay. and the dilution of the primary antibody what is the retrieval antigen retrieval method how much serum was pmc is a molecular method it is suddenly developed how much, how much is the serum blocking uh, and what was the positive control used so in case of ihc a positive control uh, used is very important because it will tell you whether your standardization of that marker for that particular tissue has done correctly or not okay so for every uh, protein or molecular marker there is one positive control uh, which we run uh, with all the sets for example in case of ifan alpha it is a uh, human renal cell carcinoma ffp tissue ffp means formalin fixed paraffin embedded and uh, we check the antibody whether it is working or not on first this positive control that means sure shot if the antibody is working if we should get the staining with this positive control and then the staining is the same protocol is applied on the tissue of uh, on which we are working okay now we'll come to the next technique which is western blotting so as in ihc we are able to understand whether the where that particular protein of our interest is located inside the cell and able to quantify it as and you people correctly asked me the questions there are some lacuna in this analysis method correct so the, both of the methods are manual whether it is a, 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 a what this a, a imagery based method or a pathologist based method so there are chances of uh, biases and discrepancy so and thus that's why uh, the quantitative analysis for uh, ihc it is called a semi quantitative analysis okay however if you want to check the exact quantitative amount of a particular protein in your cell and want to compare it across different groups then the correct technique or the precise technique would be western blotting it does not give you where the protein is present but it tells you how much exactly is the amount present of that protein in your tissue so the sample preparation or tissue homogenization is the first step in case of uh, western blotting so the sample as i said can be anything this can be cells this can be the tissue from animal this can be a tissue from a patient so this tissue is weighed uh, like in my case i weigh 0.3 gram of uh, that tissue and it is dissolved or not dissolved it is mixed with a, a particular amount of a homogenization buffer now this buffer has different components the components has their own roles basically they maintain the ph and they maintain and there are different proteases enzyme in the cell which degrade the proteins but now we are interested in the protein so we have to inhibit those enzymes so that's why we add protease inhibitor cocktail here and we get a finally after uh, this is like a physical uh, method of homogenizing the tissue what we get is what we get is a whole cell suspension that is the homogenate 
which we further use for western okay so now this is the tissue homogenate from a tissue now how how are we going to know how much protein is present in that tissue homogenate so we do the protein estimation in that case we have a protein this psa bovine serum albumin is a protein we make a known stock of this protein solution when milligram per ml and add 0 5 10 15 20 25 25 microliter in each of these tubes and in one tube you add your test sample 5 microliter okay then add a uh, ctc folin catalyst reagent which helps to like uh, convert this protein to a colored compound and then the intensity of that color is measured at spectrophotometer so more the color is developed more is your protein present basically okay so this is a graph bsa standard calibration curve where you have added serially increased amount of protein of bsa so you will get a straight linear graph okay and every straight line has a equation of y is equal to mx plus c correct so you get a equation of this now for your test sample this test sample you know only absorbance from this graph you extrapolate this absorbance to a concentration okay or uh, where y is the absorbance and this x is your concentration okay from this equation also you can find it out so now you know how much amount of protein is present in your tissue homogenate okay so usually 50 microgram of protein equal amount of protein is taken from all the test tissue samples and it is loaded on a sds page gel okay so for example now uh, here i will load a control slide here i will load uh, for the tumor slide here i will load for the treated because i have to see the difference between the uh, all the group uh, samples how much protein uh, amount is there correct so but for that matter to get an unbiased result we have to load equal amount of protein in all cells that's why protein estimation is done so we calculate 50 microgram of protein from all treatment groups and load exactly 50 micro microgram of protein in all the cells okay now this is a gel apparatus so i will not go in details of the gel apparatus it is just uh, i'll just tell you briefly that uh, this gel is made up of acrylamide uh and uh, the proteins are run uh, electrophoretically from negative electron to a positive electron okay so big proteins which are um, higher in molecular weight will run slowly behind and small proteins which are less in molecular weight will go faster okay this gel is basically porous Fine. so once you stain this gel with glumasi blue uh you get this kind of a mixture okay now okay agreed that you have uh, uh, run your protein samples but how will you know that how much molecular weight corresponds to where okay so we use this pre stained molecular uh, weight ladders which tells you uh, on gel that where that 170 kd is present there so for example this is 55 kilo dalton and uh, your protein of interest is at 50 kilo dalton then you know that okay this band corresponds to Uh, the protein of interest okay so once you have this gel ready you have to transfer this gel entirely on a pvdf membrane because that is the uh, that is the membrane which we used for further procedure so how you transfer this uh, uh, gel to a pvdf membrane with the help of again electrophoresis the uh, uh, in this this is kind of an assembly where the uh, filter pad is there paper is there uh, membrane is there gel is there again filter pad and filter pad and the basically gel and paper is sandwiched between the filter pad and electrophoresis is there the proteins again run from negative electron to positive electron and they move from gel to pvdf so what you get is suppose this is your gel you transfer it to a membrane you get a exact replica of your gel on the membrane like a zero okay all the proteins uh, at their uh, respective locations get transferred to a membrane so like if now this is the entire membrane just like a gel but you are not interested in all different proteins uh, in your test sample you are just interested in a protein which is present at 40 kilo dalton uh, like you know uh, the 
uh, in every case, uh, in every uh, protein, we know its molecular weight. Okay, it is known. So according to that, the blot is cut. Like here, we have cut the blot. Okay, and then this blot is used for further processing. Okay, so this is just a small uh, video where this is a sponge, this is filter paper, this is gel, then membrane. Again, filter paper. Again, sponge, and then the uh, proteins are transferred from gel to a membrane. Okay. So now these blots are used for uh, like uh, immunoblotting. Okay. Uh, just a minute. Hello. Yes, okay. Ashwin, go ahead. Sorry for the yeah. No, no, go ahead. So, uh, these blots are then used for immunoblotting. The principle is same, like that is used in ISC. That is ep epitope, then the uh, primary antibody against that specific epitope, secondary antibody against primary antibody, and this secondary antibody directly, there is no AP complex here. That it is directly table, labeled with an uh, enzyme. Okay, now this enzyme, what, in case of IC, what it used to be done, that enzyme used to convert substrate to a colored product, which is brown in color. But in this case, the enzyme converts substrate to a product and this reaction emits an, a light. Okay, and this light intensity is directly proportional how much antigen is present in your cell. Okay, so more the light emission, more the compound is present in your cell. So this light emission is then captured by this machine which is called as chemlock. Okay, so what we do, this is the drawer which you can see uh, the girl has placed hand over. So we put those blots on the drawer, we put substrate and immediately expose it to the chemlock. And the chemlock will give you the image like this, where this, this is control. For example, uh, in my case, these are the control lanes. This is the tumor tissue sample. These are the treated tissue sample. As you can see, the in tumors it is highly uh, highly expressed, while in uh, treated groups it is decreased, decreased, decreased. This is about your target protein. What is actin? Uh, should I explain about actin, or you already know what actin is? You can explain it briefly. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now uh, the importance of actin is very important, uh, like it is very high because uh, actin is a uh, constitutively expressed protein in every cell. So be it your uh, tumor cell, be it your normal cell, the amount of actin should be equal. It has no, uh, uh, it has no relation with tumor progression or anything. Okay, so the immunoblotting of actin tells you that yes, that indeed you have uh, loaded equal amount of protein in each cell. And despite that, you can, you see the difference between the uh, difference in expression of your protein of interest. Okay, that means see, here I have loaded uh, equal amount of protein as that of tumor. Despite that, the PCNA is expressed in lesser amount than carcinogen, than the tumor tissue sample. That means, yes, actually the PCNA is present at higher amount in tumor tissue sample as compared to the treated tissue sample, okay, for control samples. Then the analysis, uh, the best part about Western plotting is the analysis. It is very easy. You have to, you get a soft copy of this image, okay. Uh, and this soft copy is uh, exposed to the software. Uh, this is a uh, Chemidoc software. It detects how many lanes are there. Okay, that means how many sample wells were there in the plot. And it automatically detects the bands. These are called bands. Okay, it automatically detects the bands and it automatically detects the intensity of the bands. And it gives you data, total band intensity in an Excel. Okay, so you get a data of this band intensity. You get data of this band intensity also. Okay, so this is your housekeeping gene or housekeeping molecule, which is present in uh, equal amount. So you have to divide this test protein intensity by this protein intensity and you get a relative optical density. 
Okay. So this relative optical density for various different treatment groups is compared. And again, you have to see whether the decrease or increase in the protein of your interest is statistically significant. This is how the data for Western broadening is presented. Here I have present, here I have seen the uh, effect of uh, the treatment that is poly PPPs uh, on a tumor tissue sample and we were interested to see some of the proliferation markers. So in the proliferation marker is PCNA as I have already shown you the IFC images of the same. Uh, proliferation, uh, the next proliferation marker is EGFR which is overexpressed in case of only cancer and next is cyclin B1 which is a cell cycle molecule which helps the cells to undergo proliferation just like PCNA. Okay. So uh, in different treatment groups, the expression of PCNA is uh, different. Also, in case of EGFR, in different treatment groups, the expression of EGFR is different. And similarly, in case of cyclin B1. Now, we have exposed, we have repeated these uh, blots on five different animals. Okay, so this data, you see vehicle control data for PCNA, this data is of five animals. And we see whether how much uh, these five animals are deviating from each other. It is called standard deviation. How much is the expression deviating? Okay. And similarly for other uh, bars and the final relative optical density, average relative optical density of five animals is compared between the groups and see whether it is statistically significant or not. Now, in this case, the decrease of PCNA from tumor to treated to higher dose of treatment and to further for higher dose of treatment goes on decreasing the expression of proliferation. Okay, similarly in case of EGFR, it uh, the housekeeping gene is equal, uh, that means we have equally loaded the protein. However, the EGFR is down regulated. Okay, that means its expression is going down with the increasing doses. I have given the treatment with 1.5 percent dose, then 5 percent and 10 percent. Okay, similarly for cyclin. I hope I have, I have uh, made you explain with this. If you have any question about Western blotting, you can ask me. Otherwise, I'll go to the further technique. Yeah, would request everyone if any question, please post or uh, your uh, no issues if you ask directly also. Go ahead, Vishnu. Okay, I'll go. So that means, so we can conclude from this slide that PVPs, which is a test compound, has decreased carcinogen induced proliferation in hamster buckle pouch tissue in dose dependent model. So next important molecular technique is PCR. Okay, so the sample for this uh, PCR is DNA. Uh, till now we saw the technique IHC and Western blotting for which the sample was protein. Now here we are looking at DNA. So this in my lab we are working on uh, NRF2 knockout mice and NRF2 plus plus mice. Now NRF2 is a gene which is uh, a transcription factor, okay? So NRF2 is uh, basically a transcription factor which expresses the different uh, phase two antioxidant enzyme. So we have mice of uh, which, which does not have this NRF2 gene and we also have mice which, which have this NRF2 gene. Okay, so how can we differentiate between these two mice? Whether it is NRF2 knockout, or whether it is NRF2 plus plus. So what we do is once this mice is born at very young age, we cut tip of its tail. Okay. And we put this tail in an appendix and we do the DNA extraction with the help of uh, heating it with, uh, by adding it the NOH and EGTA, heat at 98 degrees Celsius, then add 360 centrifuge and finally you get is the DNA in a liquid form which we store at minus 20 degrees. Okay, so this DNA is then further used to see whether this mice was having NRF2 gene or not. Okay. Now, once you have this DNA, but how can one be sure whether whatever you are getting in this appendix is DNA or not, or how much DNA is present in this sample? Okay, so for that, uh, this machine is used, which is called nanodrop. Okay. So you have to place two microliter of this sample uh, on this arm 
okay this arm gets uplifted and you have to put that sample and again close that uh, that round arm and you get a data you can you see uh, on this machine there is one uh, table kind of sort of a thing that same table i have uh, written down here so you get data in form of absorbance at 260 by 280 nanometer absorbance at 260 by 30 nanometer and nanogram per micrometer uh, what? How much is the DNA quantity in nanogram per micrometer? Now DNA absorbs, as all know, at two uh, sixty to eighty nanometer range. So this gives you how much DNA is the pure, and this absorbance to sixty to by two thirty gives you how much is the contamination in this DNA. And nanogram per microliter is directly the quantity. So this is a very easy technique. You just have to load your sample, and it automatically gives you the quantity of the DNA. Okay. So now with this DNA, once you are sure that yes, the sample has DNA, you go ahead with the PCR reaction, that is polymerase chain reaction. So, so PCR is basically, uh, it, uh, you have a DNA and you amplify uh, in the PCR the gene of your interest. Now PCR can be of different types, a normal PCR, real-time PCR, that means it tells you how much copies of these uh, genes are present in your DNA, quantitative PCR. Reverse transcriptase PCR in which you give RNA as a sample, it converts it to a DNA and then DNA is further amplified. Then there is a multiplex PCR that means in the same PCR, you can amplify different genes of your interest, not only single, different genes in same reaction. And in nested PCR, what you do is amplify the gene of your interest and that product is then used as a template and it is further amplified okay so what are the main steps of pcr is denaturation annealing extension and, and i i will explain you with the uh, image and analysis with the electrical sorry so what are the different uh, components of pcr that is you uh, how you run the pcr basically so in an appendix you have to take pcr mix which is commercially available then PCR buffer, which is also commercially available. MGCL2, because these are the ions which are uh, required for the DNA amplification. DNTPs, that is monomers of DNAs, and primer one and prime, forward primer and reverse primer. Tag polymerase enzyme, this polymerase enzyme helps to DNA to amplify and DNA template, obviously. So then you put this, all these append of tubes on a plate, and this plate is subjected to a PCR machine in which already the cycling conditions are, uh, you have to manually uh, set those cycling condition in this PCR machine and the DNA is amplified according to those conditions. So the basic principle of PCR is basically, you have DNA, it is denatured. So there are three stages. In this machine, you have to set three temperatures. First temperature is denatured. That means uh, high uh, the DNA is treated to a high temperature so that these two strands of DNA get separated. Then annealing temperature. Annealing temperature depends upon the primer length. Primer is also a DNA which binds to the single strand of this DNA and it gives a template to tack polymerase enzyme to add further more nucleotide. Okay, and this for a bag, uh, reverse primer also, uh, DNA polymerase adds the nucleotide and gets extended. Okay, and then is the uh, extension enzyme. That means a suitable in, uh, temperature for TAC polymerase to, uh, uh, in, to add the nucleotide and extend this one. So in this way, from one DNA, two DNAs are there. Okay. So, and, and the number of cycles you keep, that also you have to feed in this machine. Those many number of copies you will get of the DNA. Now, once you are, again, what you are getting after the PCR is again a DNA, mixture of DNA, higher number of copies of the same DNA. So, how we are going to see those DNAs? In a, then, again, a gel is used. Now, in this case, this is not an acrylamide, disacrylamide gel, which was used in Western. It's, this is a different gel. This is an agarose gel. Okay. Uh, and the apparatus is like this. Basically, it is very simple. You have to boil the agarose and pour it in this kind of a uh, instrument, or uh, not in, it is just an apparatus, horizontal gel running apparatus, and wells are there. You have your DNA in your hand. 
Now, most of the time, you you just have to load, uh, take the DNA from PCR and load directly on the uh, on the on this gel, this base. Okay, because commercial this commercially available buffers and master mixers are already with the loading guide. Okay, so which helps now this DNA then further migrates on this gel. Same principle, higher uh, the number of base pairs in the DNA that is more bulkier the DNA it will run uh, back and more small the DNA that is less number of base pairs it will run ahead okay and you will get to see that again electrophoresis is done DNA will run from negative end to the positive end and if you stain this uh, gel uh, uh, not stain so you uh, you have to mix this ag uh, agarose with uh, ethidium bromide now, ethidium bromide or ETBR is an intercalating agent, and when you expose, uh, and it will go and bite to all the DNAs. Okay, so this ETBR acts as a stain. So once you expose this gel to UV light, it will, uh, this DNA will uh, uh, like illuminate like this. Okay, you we can see the bands here. So uh, our NRF to knockout in which the gene was not present, the bands were like this. Okay. Uh, so, so, sorry, this was the uh, NRF2 plus plus, where the NRF2 gene was present. So, these are the bands. We know uh, the molecular weight of the PCR product, after the, uh, and then uh, these are the NRF2 knockout in which the gene was not present. Then this will look like. So, basically, those DNAs will differ in their molecular weight, and you can differentiate between the two DNA samples. And you can then extrapolate, okay, so this DNA sample from this mice, that means this mice was NRF knockout and this is NRF2 plus. Okay. So that ends my presentation with the PCR. I have given you a very simple and basic idea about the PCR. If you have any question about it, let me. So thank you, uh, Vaishnavi. I think it was uh, made very, very simple for uh, us clinicians to understand. In fact, I would say it was really helpful for me to understand actually how much work and uh, um, uh, this hard work is put into the lab and uh, to understand that each and every step, uh, how we how uh, it is done in the lab. Uh, yeah. I think if anyone has any question, uh, because we discussed few in between also, mm -hmm. if uh, anyone would like to discuss anything, uh, can ask directly as well. Hi, Vaishnav, this is Kailash. So, Hi. can you go on that slide uh, where we check the constant, uh, percentage of PBS with carcinogen? Uh, I want uh, to ask you. IHC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. IHC? Yes, IHC, IHC. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So here you used uh, five percent PBS with carcinogen and ten percent PBS with carcinogen. Yes. So what difference you find uh, in this five percent and ten percent in DNA, in PCNA and EGFR? Can you elaborate just a bit about this? Uh, you mean to say what is the amount of expression of this yeah, PCNA? Yeah, amount of expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Amount of expression in PCNA so, and EGFR. So these are the 10x images, that is the microscope 10x images magnification. These are 40x images of the same. So mm -hmm. basically in, uh, sorry, so this is the uh, 40x images of the PCNA and these are the 40x images of the EGFR. So as you can see, the PCNA, PCNA is a basic proliferation marker. Okay, it is also yeah. present in normal cell. As you can see in vehicle control also it is expressed. Okay, mm -hmm. so... Uh, because normally also cell is undergoing amplification apart from cancer cell. Cancer cells are going in uh, like are, are undergoing proliferation at a higher rate uh, than normal cell. So as you can see, I have increased the uh, concentration of my test compound. The proliferation is going down. That is the number of cells stained with PCNA were going down. So here also, similar like Western, I have not explained uh, you in, in case of IFC, we have taken average percentage positive cells from five animals. And for each animal, we for each animal, one uh, IFC slide is there. From, uh, from one animal, we take the tissue, and for that tissue, we perform IFC. 
So from one animal, technically we have one slide of eye. Now for that IHC slide, we take 10 images of those slides. Okay, from those 10 images, we calculate thousand number of cells. Okay, and those th out of those thousand number of cells, the ratio can be anything of positive to negative cells. Then we calculate percentage positive cells. And this, uh, this percentage positive cells of all the five animals, that is all the five IHC slides we have, and out of uh, from that percentage positive cells, n is equal to five, we calculate average percentage positive. And that average percentage positive cells is then compared in case of this is EGFR plot, is compared between different groups. Okay. And this is this is error bar is basically standard deviation. How much deviation was there in the percentage positive cell count in all those five groups? So in case of 5% and 10%, this is the graph. And this is going down. It is not as good as control, but it, the expression of that marker is going down. Okay. <laughs> it's quite significant compared for 5%, uh, right? Compared to 10%? Yeah, it is quite Maybe. significant. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Got it. Thank right. you very much. So, yeah. So, uh, sorry, to I, I would like to add one more point okay. here. So, this, this is basically a test compound or a drug, you can say, or keep a preventive agent more precisely. So, we cannot expect that, yes, at 5% and 10%, we may get equal response. So, like for few markers, I have not given you my detailed data presentation. Because, uh, but for some markers, I have also found that, yes, 5% and 10%, the level of that particular marker is equal. So uh, uh, the whatever we are getting as an end product, that is decrease in tumor count or tumor uh, volume, is the uh, entire mixture of this PCNA, EGFR, COX-2, and so many other molecules which are playing role in carcinogenesis. So uh, I hope uh, you understand what yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank so you, thank you. Me, uh, yeah, as a clinician, what I understood with the discussion between the two scientists is, that uh, this uh, naturally the expression will keep will change as per the use of this uh, chemo preventive or the whatever uh, substance we are using yes. and i think there is no definite you uh, this uh, this is more of an exploratory thing i, I believe because not yes. every time you will be getting the same uh, this uh, kind of response or the finding because it will depend upon so many other factors Correct. it will upon, depend upon the type of tissue you receive the technique Correct. and so many other factors, uh, yes. I think, which I understood. Yes. So yeah. this is the graph for IHC. The graph would be different for Western. Correct. Correct. Because Correct. the Western technique is different. And right. in IHC and Western also, there are differences. In IHC, you are taking a tissue slice. One random tissue slice from an entire tissue. In case of Western, this is not the case. In, in Western, you are taking the entire tissue homogeneity. So again, the level of protein markers will differ. Correct. Right. Huh. right. So thank you, Vaishnavi. I think with this, we conclude today's class. I would again thank you. You made a very difficult topic, a very simple one. And uh, I am very sure most of us could uh, uh, actually understand it quite well. And I, uh, uh, in future also, I would request... Uh, all of you to actively participate in our series of Saturday academic classes, because sure. I think as a scientist and clinician, it is very important to be uh, sharing information and knowledge with each other and working uh, closely with each other. Correct. So thank Correct. you once again, Vaishnavi. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. I would love to present more if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Vaishnavi. Yeah.